ADP, the accounting. This is a continuation of the ADP uh, project, uh, accounting design project, which um, I give the give the uh, credit to a uh, young for initiating this uh, a number of years as the pandemic came in. Uh, I think uh, it's been it has a particular emphasis to really think about research into accounting and how to use accounting. Um, uh, it's been successful enough that uh, we're going to continue it, even though now um, I think yesterday President Biden declared the uh, COVID pandemic <laughs> over. Uh, yeah. Not that I believe oh. not that I not that I believe politicians <laughs> all the time, whatever. <laughs> um, but um, uh, the, the nice thing about it is we can gather people from uh, for, for around the world. Uh, some have difficulties with time zones, of course. Uh, we all have our local workshops and we have our conferences. But the conferences, you have to pay airfares and hotels. Uh, here, we can gather gather ourselves together uh, to hear. Uh, uh, emerging papers and uh, we think that's a good idea and we're glad that the uh, the, the idea has a considerable pa pa patronage i think um, there's 99 people registered for today's talk i see down here there's 65 or something now so um that so welcome everybody and uh, 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 all the best with all your research endeavors and i hope uh, this program is helpful to uh, in that vein uh, delighted to have uh, ray ball here um, who, of course, has been involved in this endeavor since, well, 1968 is the date that comes to mind, okay? But he's been involved in it before that, uh, and we look forward to seeing his wisdom today. But I'm actually taking over from Agnes now because Agnes is the uh, going to be the moderator, so I'll pass it over to you, Agnes. Yeah, okay, thank you. You can all hear me, right, I presume. Okay, that uh, um, serving as a moderator, I think the first thing usually is need to introduce the speaker. But I don't think I need to say much. Everybody knows Professor Ray Ball. But uh, uh, I actually try to see what I can say about uh, Ray. And uh, because of the first thing comes to our mind is like 1968 paper. So I thought, oh, I wonder, you know, when did uh, uh, Ray got his PhD? And I checked, he got his PhD in 1972 in economics. So he wrote a published paper, you know, when he got his MBA. And uh, um, so in uh, from 1972 to 2022 is 50 years, but his publication is um, more than 50 years. And I also found out he likes, uh, of course, reading, cooking. I love cooking too. And he likes clocks and uh, uh, cricket, et cetera. Lots of hobby too. So. Let's welcome Professor Rabel. It's my honor to monitor the session. But, but I wanted to uh, remind everyone that is uh, um, Ray prefer to summarize that uh, uh, his paper in about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we can ask questions, OK? And then if you have questions you want to share, please uh, chat or raise your hand later. And I'll try to moderate uh, as fairly and as effective. Ray? Hi, well, thanks for everybody for inviting me uh, and welcome all participants. Um, uh, I need to apologize for inflicting that paper upon you. <laughs> the reason uh, I would prefer to just go through a PowerPoint presentation to start out with is not because they're not my questions at the beginning. I remember I grew up in Chicago workshops where you got about 33 seconds before someone interrupted. The, uh, I'm quite uh, used to that, but this is such a sort of a rambling paper that I think it's very helpful to just summarize it overall uh, before proceeding to talk a bit about it. So that's, that's why I've taken the unusual step of um, suggesting that um, we hold off for a while, okay? Uh, so here's where I want to start. Uh, yeah, this is the county design project, and I think it's a marvelous undertaking. Uh, I think there's too little thought put into those types of issues. Uh, and my view is if you're going to get involved in accounting design to start off with, you need the criteria to design occurs. So if you have an architect coming to design a house, you got to tell them what type of house you want to design. What are your objectives? What are your criteria? Uh, and I, 
trained in economics, uh, so uh, to an economist, the criteria is going to be economic welfare. That's a no-brainer. Okay. Um, uh, I think it's important to have an aggregate perspective. Uh, to uh, not simply look at parts of accounting and the economy piecemeal. And I think it's pretty important to have a sense of accounting history. Uh, it doesn't mean that you need a fully articulated welfare economics model. Uh, I'm, I've got there in italics as a minimum, I think that uh, accounting design requires giving some thought uh, to those issues, okay? Um, so, it's a deliberately personal perspective. Um, I first got involved in reading the accounting literature in 1962, so that's 60 years ago. Uh, and it's pretty much a personal reflection on, on that. It's a very chatty style. I've got all sorts of grammatical problems where I shift from active tense to passive, active voice to passive, uh, passive voice. Uh, it's not a literature survey, uh, but the uh, I interpret the role of accounting design as getting involved in studying a preference ordering of different accounting regimes where well, an accounting regime could be we could be talking about a perturbation which is just a new standard or it could be say uh, one type of accounting versus another uh, it, it could be uh, uh, one country's regime versus another uh, uh, and so the issue is uh, how do we interpret uh, how do we evaluate accounting regimes in general okay and uh, as part of that, there are popular criteria like value relevance. How do we interpret them? Um, there's a growing volume of partial correlations in the literature where people show interesting results. So, you know, one variable is related to another and you read it and you say, that's interesting. You step back and say, hey, how, how, what does this mean in the overall perspective of things, okay? Um, so that's pretty much the approach I'm gonna be taking, okay? Here are the definitions I use. I'm going to remove the word independent in the, my next pass by because that seems to rule out management accounting. Uh, I'd like to say what accountants do is they measure and communicate economic outcomes. In accounting research, the thing I would stress there is the, the role of accounting is integral with other economic institutions and other economic behavior. You can't study it separately from them. Uh, and so that's uh, my view of accounting research. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm just defining an accounting regime in very broad terms, okay? Um, so I discussed at the beginning of the paper uh, three barriers to evaluating an accounting regime. Uh, I've added a, a fourth in the rewrite that you haven't seen, that is we lack theory on how to calibrate effects. But the first one specifying the counterfactual, I mean, the true counterfactual is no accounting at all uh, in fair evaluating an accounting regime. And of course, that's not, we can't shut accounting down to uh, as an experiment. Uh, it can be done in an experiment. Uh, but uh, I think it's important to bear that in mind because a lot of the research is focusing upon looking at, say, international financial reporting standards versus you know, domestic gap, that sort of thing, looking at just little aspects of the world. But if you step back and say, okay, in evaluating accounting, the, the you know, profession, okay, its impact is a lot, lot deeper than those sorts of uh, partial correlations imply, okay? Secondly, institutional complexity. You know, accounting is part of the economy. You can't, it, it has to be complementary to it and the institutions of the economy have to be complementary to accounting. That's just a basic principle. Uh, and accounting regime costs are largely unobservable. Uh, and so evaluating the accounting regime would have to take into account costs, but we don't get to see most of the costs, okay? So these are the barriers, okay? I'm gonna talk about archival research of real effects, price effects, costly contracting, uh, how do they relate to the criterion of, econo of uh, uh, increasing economic welfare? How do they relate to each other? So, um, I'm going to define the objective of an accounting regime very loosely as helping firms and households make better decisions, okay? Those decisions are going to be production decisions, investment decisions, consumption decisions, okay? Uh, and Looking at real effects, you know, if the regime doesn't affect real uh, effect outcomes, why do it? Why have accounting? Okay, so that's pretty fundamental. 
And so there's an emerging literature. There were there was some old literature, but uh, in the last uh, six or seven years, uh, there's been a literature studying real effects under that mantra of real effects. And I've listed some of them there. Uh, and obviously there are myriad real effects that accounting has in the economy, and we don't get to see many of them, okay? And so uh, the one of the barriers to real effects research is the lack of archival data on those real effects. And so that's why, um, uh, Leitz and uh, Waisaki uh, remand, look, uh, uh, recommend looking at non-traditional settings, okay? There's the issue of, in the real effects literature, yeah, people show real effects, but are they improving <laughs> the real effects? Uh, can we demonstrate causation? That's very hard to do in a lot of contexts. Is this a real effect that matters, okay? Uh, and that's related to the calibration problem. Is the real effect that, that is observed too large, too small, just right, like Goldilocks porridge, uh, from an economic uh, efficiency perspective? And so these are some of the limitations of the literature. Uh, and I think with a bit of luck, people will start working on uh, getting around them, okay? Um, so price effects, uh, pretty much the same objective, but through the price system. We've got a ton of archival data on equity prices. We've got reasonable data on compensation, some debt prices, some long-term supply purchase agreements that have price effects in them. Uh, uh, but uh, outside of the equity market, there's not a huge amount of data. Um, once again, does accounting cause price changes? Does it affect them versus improve them? Uh, and there's a calibration problem. In relation to whether accounting does improve prices, uh, I've got in the paper uh, uh, an interpretation of uh, Bill Beaver's work and the work that's followed from it, where we show uh, price volatility at earnings announcements. Uh, that implies that the price after the market reacts to the information released uh, uh, during an event window uh, incorporates information that the price did not before the event window. And so if you assume efficient markets, that means obviously that uh, the release of the accounting information does improve prices. The uh, Dashke and all papers are very nice paper, which tries to deal with all the endogeneity issues and they show like liquidity effects and other sorts of issues. Okay, uh, so uh, value relevance. Um, this is a, a troubled area in my belief. It's very popular. Uh, a lot of Google Scholar sites, uh, a lot of them are very recent. Uh, in a lot of circles, the people believe that value relevance were, became dead as an issue about 2000, but it continues in terms of popularity, okay? Um, so uh, Bath Beaver Landsman defined value relevance of an accounting variable as if it has a predictive relation to equity market values, okay? In other words, uh, for example, if you have a regression of uh, market value of the firm on book value of uh, equity, um, uh, it's the slope coefficient one, which is what some models predict. Uh, uh, but I believe that's a very flawed criterion from a welfare economics point of view, okay? First, the focus is on equity prices, okay? There are lots of other prices that are affected by accounting. Um, uh, it's, you know, that, that's pretty clear. Um, and those prices are not perfectly positively correlated with equity prices, conditional or unconditional on accounting outcomes. What I mean by conditional upon accounting outcomes, the effect of an accounting disclosure on equity prices is not perfectly positive, positively correlated with the effect of that disclosure on other prices. And I give some examples in the paper. One is to who think of, say, debt that is well in the money that's, say, AAA rated, uh, you know, that 10% change in earnings of the firm is not going to change the price of that debt at all. If you've got a firm which is, uh, 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 if you've got a debt instrument uh, that is underwater, uh, this, you know, deep junk uh, bonds, uh, yeah, the price of that is going to vary quite a bit with uh, an accounting outcome, okay? And so, yeah, it's the value relevance criterion as focusing on equity prices just ignores uh, effects on other prices, okay? And the last bullet I've got there is, if you're an equity investor in the firm, 
you want the firm to do its accounting in ways that other parties dealing with the firm find uh, useful. And so if the information that you put out uh, is not useful to lenders, okay, uh, they're going to price that. They're going to say, okay, we'll charge you a higher interest rate. And so equity investors have an interest in taking into account the correlations between accounting numbers and other prices, not just equity prices. So these are some of the problems with value relevance. R squared, I've got the tone on that wrong in the paper. It's a bit too negative. Uh, uh, the first bullet point here is the R squared between an accounting number and a market number tells you something about whether or not, if you're talking about an accounting number and a stock return, which is a shock to the share price, it's telling you whether the accounting number improves those prices, okay? But then there's a litany of problems with implementing it. Okay, what's the optimal R squared? Over what horizon? So if you take the, ask, the horizon of an investor or an annual horizon, take annual returns, monthly returns, daily returns, the second at which an earnings number or other accounting variable is announced, uh, there's not much in by way of theory to tell you which of those you want. Investors are diversified. Uh, Phil and I have a 1969 paper in where we made that point that if you think of random errors in an accounting number, they tend to offset in a diversified portfolio. So how, should the ask be done at the portfolio level of an investor or at the individual stock level? Um, it ignores complementarity, okay? Uh, I won't spend too much time on that, but I think that's an important issue. One of the major roles I believe of accounting is counting counting outcomes, okay? And even if there is no de, de novo new information in that outcome which is counted, it's verified by an accountant, okay? Uh, and that means that it plays a confirming role. So if managers make, you know, announce plans, are we going to make an acquisition that will increase earnings by 23% or we've got a restructuring that will increase oh, earnings by Sorry. Right. Well, the last one. Okay, you're... Hello? Yeah, sorry. Go on. I, I can't hear it. Right. Go on, go on. It was just noise. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So if managers announce private information, it is more credible if it can be confirmed. And so that's a context in which stale information, okay, uh, uh, a, a piece of uh, accounting that counts an outcome that people pretty much know creates economic value. And so that's another problem with these R squared measures, okay? Um, costly contracting, all I'll say is that is that every single party has what's called, Elsian calls a specific investment uh, in the firm uh, of uh, fee, search costs, relocation costs, whatever. Uh, and it's specific in the sense that if they leave the firm, it disappears as an investment. It's specific to the firm. So before you go to work for a firm, for example, uh, you want to know how well it's doing. Uh, uh, if you want to lend to a firm, you want to know how well it's doing. Ex post, uh, when you are still in the, when you are contracting with the firm, you want to continually recalibrate uh, how well the firm is doing. Okay, uh, and so uh, the cost. The contracting view, I think, is a very, very powerful view because all parties contract with the firm uh, want to know something about it, okay? So here's my example, my thing about how they're related. Obviously, prices and quantities are jointly determined. That's pretty obvious in an economy, okay? But what a contract does is it specifies the dimensionality of prices. So the example I've got there is, if you have an incentive contract linking management compensation to earnings, then what that contract does is determines payoffs to the manager as a function of the earnings and as a function of the accounting rules. So the accounting regime there protects prices, compensation, quantities, manager's actions and effort uh, as a function of contracting, okay? So they're all tied together, okay? Uh, I wanna get back to that in a second. What well, here, what makes people choose one perspective versus the other, real effects, price effects, costly contracting. Part of it is, do you have data? Important thing is, do you have a research template? Do you have a research design that people have used and found works? Like maybe in very early days, uh, uh, an event study, for example, okay? But that creates a tendency to work in silos. 
uh, to be a real effects person, a price person, or a costly contracting person. And Kuhn tells us that's sort of a normal science, but in this case, as the previous slide show, the streams intersect. And so if you're interested in a the topic, then you can look at it in different ways, okay? Uh, um, this is where I pretty much want to finish. Uh, there's an emerging literature on externalities and distributive effects. Um, there are positive externalities, there are classic you know, negative externalities. So the positives are the classic rationale for regulation. Um, Oh, I've got a note saying my internet connection is unstable. Sorry about that. Uh, but uh, there's also a literature on how standard setters and regulators take actions that affect firms and, and investors differentially. And so uh, affect private versus public. Um, I should point out the, the literature contains a lot of average effects. And so cross-sectional regression slope is an average effect uh, on all of the firms or individuals in the sample. And yeah, it's, one views the errors in that regression as sort of just some random effect, but maybe it's a real dispersion. So let me take an example. Okay, if you're looking at the inter introduction, introduction of IFRS on investment efficiency, you, you, you can get an average effect, but it could have reduced some firms in, in uh, investment efficiency and increased others not by just random chance, but just simply because of institutional factors. And so I think that uh, looking at dispersion effects, the underlie averages that we typically report are worthy of a lot of study. So to finish, uh, yeah, if you're gonna get involved in accounting design, you need to know something about the criteria uh, uh, and you need an aggregate perspective and a sense of accounting history. So thanks for listening. Um, uh, and I'm very open to questions. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, that I have not seen any question on the chat. Anyone wanted to uh, ask question? You can either raise your hand or yeah, I see uh, Basu. Hi, Ray. Long time no see. Long time no see. So, how are you doing? Good. So I wanted to come to your definition of accounting as independent measurement. And you mentioned that, say, it excludes managerial accounting. Yeah. But a lot of the accounting that we observe in old uh, civilizations also is like household accounting or farm accounting and so on, which yeah. were used, you know, even the records that you refer to in Mesopotamia and Egypt, a lot of it was internal or the tax records are internal to the government, they're not really for external reporting. So okay. I'm wondering if you want to distinguish between bookkeeping and accounting, the difference being external audit in some way or you know, independent verification as opposed to independent measurements because there's clearly yeah. a lot of historical bookkeeping that didn't advance to what we would now call accounting with ratio analysis and you know, financial intermediaries and external reporting. The history yeah. is mainly internal. Yeah, so I, I think that's really important and I apologize for putting that independent in the US and something to take it out, but I'm not too sure I want to take it out completely. The reason is the following. Internally within firms, people want to be treated equitably, okay? And so if you're measuring performance of divisional manager A, divisional manager B, or some person in you know, some particular operation, okay? Uh, you want to have methods of accounting that are fair across those people. And I think that's one of the roles of an internal auditor. Uh, uh, now, not all firms have formal internal auditors, but I think that in many ways informally, uh, there is an independent check on how the numbers are calculated in most organizations. Why, why do you report them in, internally? It's because you use them. If you use them, that affects different people differentially. And so people don't like living in a world where someone arbitrarily treats them in terms of measuring their success, okay? And you know, there's, you know that there's a lot of experimental evidence on that, right? Uh, with you know, chimpanzees and stuff like that. And so we don't like to be treated fairly. So I've got to be very careful on treading on some, some grounds here that are fairly complicated, okay? Um, so that, that was one issue you raised. I've forgotten what the other one was um, that was related to that. Um, 
It was about external uh, disclosure versus internal use. So, I mean, it's uh, yeah, yeah. like, uh, you yeah. know, no. Mainly concerned with yeah. the external market or external parties reporting externally, but yes. a lot of the historical evidence is internal use, not exclusively, but a lot of it is. So I just. Yeah. So you mentioned bookkeeping. I think bookkeeping is, a, you know, I'm pretty sure you agree with that. This is a pretty fundamental measurement process. I mean, that's what's going on is, I mean, a, a cure, if you are keeping the books where you say you have an asset account and you're you know debiting and crediting that asset account you're measuring the amount of assets okay and so um to my mind uh, bookkeeping is probably the fundamental measurement process in accounting and then we lay accounting standards and stuff on top of that for external reporting but um i i, I my one of the reasons for, I should say something about that in the paper. One of the reasons for writing this paper is I think people report all these random correlations in the literature and never go or seldom go back and look at the fundamentals underlying the contribution of accounting to the economy. Okay, so, you know, that, that's, that's my thing in this paper. So I'm, I'm on your side on all of it, uh, but I do need to clarify how I write some of it. Yeah. So, okay, uh, Gil, Sadka, can you? Can I ask you a question? Please unmute, yeah. Hey, hi, Ray. Um, hey. So I, I want to introduce another concept which I know you're aware of is Pareto efficiency. And yeah. you know, it's very difficult to have the accounting that we all want. We want something that will be really informative and will be great for contracting and can be audited. And, you know, and at, at some point the real problem is um, we have some contradicting forces. If you want it really informative, you want all the information possibly available, some of it will be forward looking, but then the audited part, then would it be useful for contracting? You're going to lose some. So I remember uh, when I look at some of the, um, uh, when I teach accounting, I, I look at some of the, the goals that people have for accounting, will be good accounting. And I show my students, look, if you want this one, you're going to have to lose this one. And if you want, so it's always been kind of that it requires us to prioritize which what do we really want and i think that's where that's why the field has always been kind of arguing some people want this one and some people think the other one is better um, yeah, yeah. and i think that's why we have this conflicting views all the time because it's really difficult to make everybody happy yeah so that's why at the back of the paper i started talking about uh externalities and distributional effects uh yeah, this you know, parade optimality is, a, as you know, it's a pretty limited criteria. And so yeah, there has to be, in reality, some trade-offs between different interested parties. Okay, and I agree totally with that. Um, so, you know, the one you know we spoke about is, uh, is what are the interests of equity holders versus debt holders uh, in financial reporting? Okay. Uh, and I think they're very, very different. And so, what I would like to see, uh, you know, after I've left this planet, uh, is that there was more research on these sort of distributive effects, okay? Um, and a lot of it's been in recent years, and it's coming up with some very, very interesting results. So one of my favorite ones is that um, private companies gain from information released by public companies in their own industry, and the, the amount they gain is increasing in the extent to which public companies dominate the industry. In other words, you know, the more public companies there are that are reporting relative to the number of private companies, the more the private companies learn, okay? Uh, so that's a distributive effect that is not just within parties dealing with one firm, but it's, one, it's across firms, okay? Now, yeah, and there's the research on the impacts of regulation and you know, new accounting standards on large versus small firms. Uh, and some of the results are sort of things that I wouldn't have expected, but they are you know, not surprising ex post when you look at them. Um, so, okay, yeah. I think Ayang. So I, I, yeah. I think there's a mountain of work to be done on this. Yeah. So, Ayang, you want to ask a question? 
Yeah. Hi, Ray. Uh, can hey. you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so I think as a, as a relatively junior faculty member on the call, I think uh, when I read your commentary, I tried to kind of think about what are the uh, new ways that we should conduct research going forward. Um, so I think my understanding of the piece is we should try to take an integrated view, try to think about the usage of information within institution and also external to the institution across different stakeholders, and then try to actually motivate the empirical design or question based on theories. And over the past few years, that when I collaborate with theories, what the, the difficulty we face is somehow if we go to the IO literature or economic literature, usually they focus on real effects uh, or decisions within firms. When we go to the finance theories, it's more about the capital markets across different capital providers. But to kind of combine endogenize two markets and then add the information friction into it, it's kind of out of control. Like we just, as an empiricist, we just don't really have a lot of guidance from uh, integrated view from theories with information angle and then plus endogenize both product market and capital market. But is that something you think uh, is the direction we should kind of try to try to kind of move forward um, because it's challenging. Yeah. So, so I'm definitely not a person who believes that you need a fully articulated theory to underlie what you do, okay? Uh, so uh, I'm not saying we need a general equal, equilibrium model of the economy to sort of you know, study anything in accounting. But I do think it's very helpful for not just researchers, but teachers, you know, and people who are in our profession, okay? Um, to have a, a more of an aggregate overview of things, okay? Um, so that's just as a broad conceptual issue, okay? Secondly, in terms of research, yeah, I think that, that people would gain with their working in real effects from thinking about price effects implications, okay? If you were people working in price effects, thinking about real effects uh, and, you know, not, not viewing costly contracting as a totally different area. So I think having some notion of the the, the, the integral nature of these things has to help you in your research, okay? And similarly, um, uh, the, the, at the end, the issue of this, you know, distributed effects, uh, I think, yeah, just knowing that these are, are issues, taking an aggregate perspective and saying, okay, uh, instead of showing an average effect, let's have a look at all the effects that lie behind the average. I think it is an area of research that is possibly you know, very fruitful. Um, so let's take the example I gave of an average effect uh, of IFRS on investment efficiency, okay? Well, the interesting issue was why it was some firms different than others, okay? Do I just uh, random errors in my data? Uh, or is it that some firms are affected in differential ways than others, okay? And um, I, I think that's probably uh, one of the takeaways of, of, of taking more of an aggregate perspective, okay? I, I don't know whether that would answer your question very well. <laughs> yeah, so kind of related question. Xiaoming, you wanted to ask a question or me read uh, your question? Okay, I'll, I'll read your question. Will the distributional effect cause underproduction of information and mandatory disclosure is the solution? Ray, do you hear the question? Yeah, well, there's literature on mandatory disclosure causing distributional effects. I mean, that's one of the uh, the areas. Uh, and so um, uh, you can show that uh, the, this research literature on mandatory disclosure uh, affecting large firms differentially than small firms. Uh, and it's, um, I, I think there's a political economy thing underlying this. In other words, the, the, uh, are the mandatory disclosure laws more driven by large companies that um, uh, contribute to politicians and that sort of thing. But uh, it's clear that mandatory disclosure is one of the distributional effects problems. Okay. Um, in terms of underproduction, um, I mean, there's, 
it, the external positive externalities say, yeah, there's underproduction of information. Negative externalities say there's overproduction. So yeah. the the typical negative externalities are uh, is the assumption of crowding out, where there's some type of charm, some uh, inelasticity in the system, so that if we add one piece of information to it, we crowd out another one. Okay. Um, I'm not a big fan of that because I think that's a short-term thing. And I think the long-term elasticities are very different in the short term. But so yeah, uh, distributional effects can cause both under and overproduction. Uh, and so you know, mandatory disclosure can cause um, distributional effects. So it's a very messy type of thing. I think the literature on this is new, very new. And I think there'll be a lot more people working on it, hopefully uh, in the short term. Great. So Ray, uh, I actually have a question and uh, um, actually like sometimes I travel and pe people sit next to me, ask me, what do you do? And I said, well, uh, I teach. And they say, what do you teach? I said, teach accounting immediately say, oh, you have to teach me taxes. You know, you can help me with the taxes. You can help me with the cost analysis. So then, uh, but I actually, I know cost analysis, but nothing about taxes and except the economic policy. So I start to tell people that when they ask me what I do, I say I'm accounting economist. And it seems <laughs> like, uh, you know, that like financial economics. And then they don't ask me that question. So from the economics point of view, that uh, I feel like since that you are uh, sharing with us that how uh, accountants can think, you know, for the economy and for the welfare. And you identify like a, a three uh, facts. You say real facts, price effects, and the cost of contract, et cetera. So I'm just kind of wondering that because price effects in a way is also real effects. Contract is also real. And because of a lot of times real effects go through the contract, affect the price. So I'm just wondering when you say real effects, you kind of mean like the decision making, you know, by the company or the effect on decisions for the economy can you uh, because it, i'm sure you also said those three kind of overlap but i just wonder can you elaborate a little bit about the real effects that you you specifically mean and specially interested in well so real effects are, i mean everything is real i mean a price is real okay yeah. uh, you know a, a contract is real so there's an ambiguity in the term right and so that's why yeah. I point out that your know, real effect, people are talking about quantities, okay? Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, the way I defined it was, you know, a very abstract level. We're talking about uh, decisions of both uh, firms and households, okay, uh, that are real. Uh, and so, for, you know, firm, they're, and I said, they're production, investment, and consumption decisions. So that's it. The way I defined it is pretty abstract. Uh, obviously, there are myriad decisions of those types. Okay, so you know, firms' production and investment decisions is very abstract level, but there are lots and lots of decisions that firms make in production. Okay, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, do you have an internal accounting system that could? incense a salesperson to make a decision to go out and chase an order, okay? Um, yeah, that's a, a real phenomenon, okay? Uh, and there are, you know, millions of them occurring within a firm every year. Um, and so, yeah, I, I hit it at a very aggregate conceptual level by saying, okay, production, investment, and consumption. They, excuse me, this is the three major categories that I think an economist would, would use. Um, but underlying that, there's an enormous complexity. Uh, that's, that's why there's a problem that we just don't have much archival evidence on the huge number of real effects. Uh, uh, you can do case studies within, within firms, okay? Um, uh, people in management accounting try and get hold of this sort of thing. But um, yeah, uh, it, you know, real effects are, to summarize out what I think of as quantities. Good, thank you. I have three hands here. I'm going to call Steve first. Steve, can you unmute? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Uh, so 
Ray, um, the, the perspective is good, and I think it's very good for everyone to keep in mind that there's this agri-perspective, um, which is economic welfare. I'm not sure our friends at uh, AOS Journal would actually add other things, but um, uh, but the, the, uh, I think it's very good to keep this in mind. But and in the end, uh, there's a lot in the paper that says, hey, listen, it's hopeless, okay? Um, uh, there's data limitations. You can't observe a lot of prices. Observing stock prices by itself, now you're very cynical about that. So I'm a little worried about younger researchers coming away a little cynical about where they can really make grab hold of something and really see that they're making a contribution uh, to this aggregate welfare. Uh, how they can think about it and how how can they how can they prioritize. Uh, research questions which get us along the path, even though we cannot observe ultimately the welfare effects. So you mentioned cynicism. I mean, my, I'm very cynical of the incentives given to researchers in schools where they give you tenure by the number of counting the number of pubs you have. Um, and so there's an incentive just to you know, get an interesting correlation published, okay? Um, so in many ways, the message I'm trying to get across probably applies more to tenured people who are still interested in doing research, okay? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a cynical view, right? <laughs> and listen, I'm, I'm old, so I've got an opportunity. I can afford to be cynical, okay? Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I think it's my, I think for very young people, the message I'm trying to get across is just to make them prouder of the profession they're in and understand a lot about what it does to the economy, okay? Yes. Mm. And to people, okay? Uh, so that, that's part of the reason I'm writing this. Bear in mind that, as I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm apologizing for what this is. I've never written something like this before. This is a, I read, I read my first accounting text, uh, theory text in 1962. In, um, in 1962, it was Gilman's Accounting Concepts of Profit. And I was hooked. Uh, and that's 60 years ago. Uh, and so I'm looking back on 60 years in sort of a, an old man's view <laughs> of the literature, okay? But nevertheless, I do, as I said, I do think that young people would gain from having some notion of the history of accounting, how deep it is, how many civilizations it existed in, uh, mm -hmm. what the width of its contribution is to the world, okay? Uh, it's not something you can teach in an introductory accounting class because the students will be bored when you told them that. Um, but I, I do think as for people, it's important to have that sort of perspective. Okay, I think uh, next in line is Sadipta. I think you raise hand uh, before Richard. So Richard will be the next. Okay, so I wanted to come back to this uh, discussion about regulation and, uh, you know, you mentioned lobbying, but I think that that takes us in the direction of political equilibrium because it's not just the regulators, there's Congress people that in intervene, the SEC that intervenes and so on. And so, you know, the typical treatment of the regulators and standard setters as though they're acting the public interest but we know that from public choice, they also have self-interested motivations. And then some of it is just pure ideology, right? So we see the switch between administrations and what the SEC does or what various agencies do. And so it's difficult to think of the regulation as driving towards economic welfare, at least systematically. And so I'm just wondering what you think about the way that the political system interacts with the ability of accounting to increase economic welfare? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, the SEC on their website, they are not political, which is nonsense. Okay, now this, you know, that, and to people from outside the US, I think the similar thing applies everywhere else. So if you look at what happened to the SEC when the Trump administration went out and the Biden administration came in, the way it's set up is there are three commissioners and the, the, the chair and one other comes from the party that controls the Congress, okay? And so you switch from a Republican SEC to, excuse me, to a Democratic SEC. 
And so all of a sudden they start unwinding a lot of the stuff that Trump did. And um, by the way, I'm not taking a position on this, what's good or bad, just describing what happened. So they unwound a lot of the stuff that Trump administration did, and they introduced a whole bunch of new things that would have horrified the Trump people. And so it's, there's no doubt that it's political, okay? Um, I mean, it's, it's ultimately the SEC reports annually to Congress on its activities. Um, and it counts, you know, it counts the number of things that it did in one category after another. Uh, and the Congress is the ultimate master, okay? Um, and so, yeah, it's obviously very political. Um, so that means there are some regulations that, that, uh, that go through for political reasons, okay? Uh, what, it's good for us researchers because it gives us things that we can research, okay? Okay, um, uh, that's number one. Uh, number two, different administrations, I think, would have different views on distributional effects. So, excuse me, I think, uh, I, this is, I'm talking off the top of my head here, but I think the Trump administration was more receptive to small business than the Biden administration. So there's this literature on differential impact of regulation on firms as a function of size, and that includes accounting regulation. Um, I think the PCOB, PCAOB has differential effects as a function of size. And so, uh, it gives some researchers and a change administration gives people something to research, right? So, uh, but yeah, I think there's no, no doubt that uh, both the average effects and the distributional effects are a function of political forces. Yeah, thank you. Richard, can you unmute? Yeah. Ray, uh, I want to encourage you to keep writing papers. They're a joy to read. I look forward to them. So please do whatever you want to write on. Now, the question I have is I, agree that real effects are large and far reaching if I can confine myself to financial reporting in this case. And I wonder, maybe I'm wrong about it in the sense of the effects managers could have on these real effects. When we teach financial accounting at the MBA level, we just teach the rules. We don't have a course then that goes on and suggests, well, here's why you should use straight line instead of accelerated or FIFO versus LIFO. And I don't think it's only regulation because in taxes, we do teach the tax law, but then we also teach a class on how to optimize firm value or take any other subject like marketing or operations research. They're all taught from the point of view of how the manager can use what we know to increase firm value, but we never have a financial accounting course. And I don't really know the answer to the question. If somebody were to ask me, should I use straight line or accelerated, which would maximize the value of the firm? I, in fact, I'm more likely to say it doesn't matter. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, well, first of all, I taught introductory accounting to MBAs uh, uh, and in the latter years, executive MBAs a lot, okay? And the rules, yeah, I, I told them the textbook will tell them what the rules are and they can take it home with them and put it on their shelves if they want it at a later date, but they need to understand what you do with them. And so I actually taught after we finished the, like at about week five, I taught the Paul Brown paper, the, um, uh, the um, uh, Bernard and Thomas paper. Uh, uh, I, I did be some research stuff on financial ratio, Beaver's stuff on financial ratios. Okay, you know, you, you teach financial ratios, but you show them some evidence. Okay, um, uh, and so on. The one you mentioned, straight line versus depreciation. I had a little case I put together. Uh, saying, okay, why is everybody on straight line when they have to use accelerated tax? If you look at it, 98% of the of firms use uh, straight line. And if you look at the dynamic of it, what happens is if under accelerated depreciation, if you are growing and you invest, uh, you know, increase your investment, straight line dep uh, accelerated depreciation really penalizes you because it hits you with a big hit from the first year write-off, okay? 
And so I showed, I did the calculations to, you know, numerical calculations to show them this and said, okay, suppose you were bored, okay, that once your managers to grow the business, and it, it you know it takes some effort you, you you're going to spend more you know have less free nights less golf games and you're really building a business okay uh, and then you say okay what i'm going to do is hit you with a method of accounting that penalizes growth uh no way in the world would you want to do that and we've lived through a period of extensive growth uh, in the economies and, and so i think that's why firms almost universally go for straight line Okay, so I used to teach this, okay. Um, the executives used to love it. Uh, the, uh, when I taught undergrads, they didn't like it because they just wanted simple answers. You know, what are the rules, okay? Uh, but the execs loved it. Uh, yeah, and I, I actually think it's more, it's important in an introductory accounting class to talk to people about who uses the numbers and what the effects of using them are, okay? Uh, so that's what I always do. As I said, the executives to love it. Okay, more questions? So Ray, I'm, I'm, uh, I have another question that I'm um, thinking about that uh, while you're talking about the uh, prepare financial reporting and selecting different methods, real facts, et cetera. And how about the behavior part? like investors, preparers, users, all of those kind of behavior research, how would that fit into the accounting design region? Could you repeat that, please? I've, I've got a bad- Yeah, I'm, I'm basically asking, I'm sorry, I mean, repeat. I'm just asking like behavior aspect. Here, like uh, you cover a lot of the economic aspects of accounting. I'm just kind of wondering how this interact with the behavior aspects. Do you hear me? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, like I, earnings I management, you know. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I yeah. tried to talk about uh, uh, institutions and behavior. I might need to make sure I strengthen that up a little bit. Thanks for that comment. Uh, yeah, because uh, you know, real effects occur through behavior, right? Yeah. Uh, and the only place I really talk about that is in price effects where I talk about how the value of relevance people are assuming market efficiency okay um, and I should maybe broaden that more that's a good point okay because uh, the same issue arises with real effects and you know, cost of contracting um, there's a behavior aspect to it okay so the, the, when I'm talking about efficiency in value, all of us say, look, okay, how would you interpret an R squared between earnings and, and returns and earnings announcements uh, if your view is there's excess volatility in the markets, okay? Uh, uh, how would you interpret it if your view is investors functionally fixate on earnings? And so the reason the prices move is because they're functionally fixated on the numbers, okay? And so, if under those sorts of inefficiency stories, okay, it, it's very unclear that you want to use a price criteria. And so I, I discussed that in the context of the, the uh, uh, value relevance uh, stream of literature. I guess mm -hmm. that's a good point. I should discuss it in general, okay, that there will be okay. assumptions underlying all of this. Yeah. Thank you. Aya? Hi. Hi, Ray. Yeah, I Hi, guess the, the junior researcher is probably a little shy today, so I try to ask another <laughs> question from uh, the group. I, I think uh, a, a very commonly used uh, research approach is kind of data driven, right? Uh, from your commentary, is that the reason we don't have a lot of research on real effects is because we don't have data from within the firm, so we don't know how managers use that information. So there are a couple of different ways I think managerial accountants have used to actually uh, address their research question, either run a kind of field experiment, focusing on only one firm, one or a few locations, or maybe just ask them by conducting a survey. Uh, what's, your view, what's your view on those kind of non-archival uh, approaches and how likely that the top journals are going to actually be open to those new methods yeah, yeah. yeah. no uh, of course they're very valuable uh, I might 
you have to put a note about that. <laughs> this, this thing keeps getting longer and longer. Uh, I taught the doctoral colloquium at the University and the Euro European Accounting Association for its first 15 years. And what struck me was the extent to which the Europeans were doing surveys, okay? Uh, not just managerial yeah. people, but financial people, like surveys of financial analysts or whatever, okay? And it always struck me that Americans were not following that route. I think surveys are underused, okay? Uh, you have to be careful how to interpret them, okay? Uh, there's some surveys uh, that uh, I might comment on at some point uh, on managers cooking the books. Uh, so you, there's a lot, you have to know how to do a survey. Uh, construct validity is an important issue in surveys. That is, is the person who answers the question interpreting the question the way the researcher interprets it? Okay, uh, so there, there are special techniques that you need to have for surveys, and if they're well done, they obviously provide a large amount of information. Okay, so yeah, surveys definitely. I'd like to briefly talk in this context about experiments. So, you know, SNP, they've done some work, right? SNP, well, if you're still there, uh, of what happens when you give one team accounting feedback and another team not, okay? Because then you get into the, the fundamental uh, uh, benchmark. Okay, um, uh, the fundamental counterfactual. So you provide, there's no information, no accounting information versus some. And so I think experimental work uh, has been underdeveloped uh, and been sort of overwhelmed by archival work. But you know, archival work, you can sit at your desk and you can um, uh, download a data file. Okay, experimental work, you've got to get out and do something. Uh, and I think there should be more of it. Yeah, I think time's about up, but we have one last question and I'll read it uh, for Hang Fang. If you want to say anything, feel free. The question is, can we evaluate ESG reporting using welfare economic criteria or do we need another criteria? Do you hear the yeah. question? Okay. Yeah, equity. I mean, uh, ESG, ESG reporting. ESG, you know, climate change, environmental reporting, and using welfare economic criteria. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. Yeah. I see it now. Um, yeah. I, um, I think in theory, obviously, you, you could. Uh, whether you can in practice is another matter. Um, mm -hmm. And... You know, it's, I, it's hard to answer because it, I don't know yet what ESG reporting is, okay? Uh, <laughs> people trying to work out ESG standards. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are yeah. value judgments in it. Some people value one aspect, some people value another. Uh, and so I, I don't have a good handle on it. Uh, and I apologize to Peter Easter, my friend, <laughs> on that. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah. I think it's, it's early days, and I really can't answer the question except to say, in theory, yes. That's the only way you can evaluate it, using welfare yeah. economic criteria. I mean, by the way, you know, welfare economics involves multi-generational issues as well. And I think a lot of ESG reporting is a multi-generational issue. Uh, uh, well, it obviously is. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm my grandparent, my grandchildren are going to be you know, living in a very uncomfortable world, okay? Um, uh, yeah, uh, so in theory, the answer is yes. Uh, that's the only way to do it. In practice, it is hideously complicated. One, because what is the particular ESG reporting to be? And two, it's got multi-generational issues in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think our time is up, uh, A. Young, and you wanted to wrap it up? Yeah. No, I think, thank you everyone for coming. I think the next event will be next Tuesday. Like very kindly put it on the last slide. Uh, Jeremiah Green will present the paper next Tuesday uh, at 11 a.m. Yeah, and if you yeah. anyone has any questions for Ray, like in his generosity to kind of stay for a few minutes uh, if you'd like to ask him questions or discuss something offline. Okay, so we look forward to seeing everybody uh, next week. Thank you, Ray yeah, thank and you. Agnes and Steve. Yeah. And, and thank you, thank everybody. You. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Thanks for listening and thanks for your question.